You know, I think it might accelerate activity, but in special situations, I'll give you an example. Um, Dell Technologies, Inc. owns about 80-odd uh, percent of a company called VMware. Remember that? Oh, and, yes. and that was a huge LBO done in uh, 2016, 2016. And Dell has an incredibly large amount of interest expense that is now under siege because of this limitation they've enacted on the deductibility of interest mm -hmm. expense. In order to deduct interest expense, you have to have a lot of EBITDA. And Dell doesn't have enough to be able to deduct all of its interest expense. It's just worth saying that EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. For tax purposes, it's called adjusted taxable income. However, VMware, their subsidiary, has a, a tremendous amount of adjusted taxable income that Dell would like to be able to take into account in calculating its limitation. But right now, at least under the legislation, there's no provision in the legislation to treat the members of an affiliated group or a consolidated group as a single entity so that each taxpayer has to make its own calculation, cannot take into account the EBITDA of its affiliates for the purpose of increasing its own interest deduction limitation. So there's been a lot of talk about uh, Dell and VMware merging. And by merging, they'd form a single entity, and at that point there'd be no question about the ability of Dell's interest expense to be absorbed by and to be bolstered by VMware's EBITDA. So I'm thinking, you know, there could be situations where companies have favorable characteristics under the legislation and unfavorable, mm -hmm. an unfavorable profile, and perhaps that in and of itself would spur them to merge. I mean, there has to be a business rationale for the merger as well, and, and in the Dell VMware case, it's hard to find that, but in any event. Um, so I am getting a lot of um, suggestions from my clients about, you know, s companies that are occupying different spectrum, different points of the, you know, have been winners and losers, if you will, under the bill, and perhaps, you know, a merger that would, um, mm -hmm. that would, uh, create one company that comes out pretty good under the bill. Yeah. Other, another thing is the, um, the studying or the analysis of MLPs and whether they ought to uh, incorporate by checking, you know, by doing something as simple that's as filing an entity yeah. classification yeah. election. We have one MLP that's made that decision already, a company called Aries Investment Management. Uh, a lot of the other ones are studying that possibility. F right now, we have an unprecedented disparity between individual rates and corporate rates. Corporate rates are much lower than individual rates, even even though, as Michael pointed out, the uh, while the top individual rate is 37 percent for MLP income that passes through, it's only 29.6. So the disparity isn't quite as stark as it as it could be, but there's an, an awful lot of interest in that. Last week we had a decision by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, to take away certain tax benefits that uh, MLPs were enjoying as regards their, uh, their rate setting process. However, FERC did say that if you were operating under their aegis as a corporation, they would give you continue to give you this tax benefit so that people think that that too will spur many of the MLPs, which are many of them are under the authority of, of FERC, to, to either incorporate on their own or if they're owned primarily by a general partner to do a roll-up with that general partner. Case in point would be what um, Kinder Morgan did a couple of years ago uh, where KM KMP rolled up into KMI. This talk that Williams, WMB might roll up WPZ, things like that. So I'm getting those kinds of, you know, kind of odd, you know, inter, you know, uh, on micro type situations. Mm -hmm. 
What about uh, carried interest and the new three-year holding period to get capital gains, long-term capital gains? Well, you know, they talk about that being, you can circumvent that apparently by creating an S-Corp and yes. having the They're S-Corp hold the anyway. applicable partnership interest. And they did announce they were going to shut that down. But if you look at the legislation mm -hmm. itself, it doesn't provide much authority, in my view, for the shutdown that they've threatened. You know, the legislation says if the applicable partnership interest is held by a, a corporation, it's not subject to any of these, uh, mm -hmm. you know, prohibitions or limitations. They didn't say if it's held by a C corporation, they said a corporation. And, you know, Congress, when it wants to um, be more specific about what type of corporation it's referring to, it will make that designation. So the I think a lot of people feel that there's absolutely no authority for Treasury to, to administratively narrow that uh, exemption to, to cases where the applicable partnership interest is held by the C Corp. Well, that's going to be an interesting. It will be. It's yes. going to be an interesting round because Treasury is yeah. going to write regulations. Oh, of course, without that. That say that it applies to oh, S without, without a doubt. Without a doubt. It's going to create litigation right. to to see if it works. No, no question. Um, you know, the litigation itself may take several years. Um, people are betting, I think, when they do this that there's going to be either no technical corrections bill mm -hmm. or a technical corrections bill won't fix this mm -hmm. um, because it was passed by republicans only the democrats don't have a lot of right. incentives to help right. fix things on the other hand finding democrats if you could find a way to separate this provision out and put it onto some other bill that needs to be signed, like an omnibus spending bill, as they mm -hmm. did with this so-called grain glitch that just happened, yeah. Yeah. the Democrats would vote to uh, eliminate the subchapter S corporation. So I mean, there may not be much downside in creating an S corporation. It doesn't cost you a lot of money, and it gives you an argument. And maybe, you know, on audit, you'll settle uh, for something. Um, and, and, but it's a, it's a very interesting sort of tax planner's dilemma in terms of positions that you take and what you tell your clients is likely to happen and so forth. It would be, a, it would be an interesting exercise. We don't, we don't do a lot of this at the law school, but it would be a really interesting exercise in writing opinion letters <laughs> to see exactly what one should say about, about forming an S corporation and its likelihood of success over time.